now we're lighting the the uh, Shabbat candles, even though tonight is the not Shabbat. So Friday night into Saturday night is Shabbat. And because we are lighting one for remembrance and one for observance, we are taking time to observe our Messiah and taking the time to remember our Messiah. And now we are going to... Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Peace and prayer. So, Father, we are reading your word as a declaration, as a prayer. Thank you for opening the eyes of our heart and giving us understanding. I pray that the Father of glory, the God of our Lord, Yeshua, the Messiah, would impart to you the riches of the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation to know him through your deepening intimacy with him. I pray that the light of God will illuminate the eyes of your imagination, flooding you with light until you experience the full revelation of the hope of his calling. That is the wealth of God's glorious inheritance that he finds in us, his holy ones. I pray that you will continually experience the immeasurable greatness of God's power made available to you through faith. Then your lives will be an advertisement of this immense power as it works through you. This is the mighty power that was released when God raised Yeshua from the dead and exalted him to the place of highest honor and supreme authority in the heavenly realm. And now he is exalted as first above every ruler, authority, government, and realm of power in existence. He is gloriously enthroned over every name that is ever praised, not only in this age, but in the age that is coming. And Yeshua alone is the leader and source of everything needed in the life of the believer. I'm going to read that again. And Yeshua alone is our leader and our source of everything needed in our lives as believers. God has put everything beneath the authority of Yeshua Messiah's feet and has given him the highest rank above all others. And now we, his community, his own our Christ's body, in which he speaks and acts, by which he fills everything, absolutely everything and everyone is present. Yeah, don't go too far. Yeah. All right. Um, um, we forgot last time to hand out our, our um, base scrolls. Last week we got talking, so we went, before you pass it out, the face scroll. Um, this face scroll has um, the word Shabbat on it, and it has the word Ketubah on it. Um, because re you remember the what all creation witnessed when when Father Elohim created our existence. For the first time in existence, all the heavenly hosts saw a creature that looked like the Father. And that was amazing to them. Not only did the creature look like the Father, but the creature was triune like the Father and Yeshua and the Holy Spirit, whom they were very, they, they were round with them forever then they noticed that the father blessed them then they noticed that the father told them to multiply then they noticed the father gave them dominion and authority over the earth and then they witnessed that that the father had shabbat shabbat was not made Man wasn't made for Shabbat. Shabbat was made for man. The Sabbath. The Sabbath was designed so that you and the Father can spend some time working on your relationship. Nowhere does the Bible tell us that I'm in covenant with an angel. 
And nowhere does the Bible tell us that God is in covenant with an angel. But God is in covenant with man. So um, we also seen that Lucifer deceived Adam and Eve and gave away their birthright, their authority. We also saw that the old, the entire Old Testament prophesies the fact that the Messiah is coming. And we took you back. And if you notice on your little yellow flyers or your dividers, it always says where it began. We're taking you back where all this has began. Where did man fall? How did man fall? How did we get in this mess? We're always taking you back to the beginning. And we've taken you back to salvation. And now we're going to take you back to why we are called the bride of Christ. You ever wonder why we are called the bride of Christ? How did that really come about? Why am I the bride? I'm the guy. You know, how am I the bride of Christ? We're taking you back to that time, how we, we're, we're, uh, how we become the bride of Christ. So last time we got together, I just want to throw this commercial in. Last time we got together, we are doing Passover. Soon we are hosting Passover over at the barn. So we would like to encourage you to come to Passover. Um, we passed out a flyer. If you want a flyer, we'll, we have all, also the past lessons also if you need them um, and the past information. But we're doing Passover. Passover is such a wonderful, rich time when you, when you do pass where you partake of the cups. And then after that, we are going to do Shavuot 50 days later. Shavuot is so crazy, amazing what Shavuot, we're going to talk about that tonight, Shavuot, and why Shavuot should really be important to every believer. So last week was tough. And after we got done, the very next day, um, this is how the father works with me. You remember when I was telling you, I drive down the road, and you see me talking to myself in my truck. Don't think I'm talking to myself. I'm actually you know, having a conversation with the father. So my father, uh, the very next day, uh, he goes, Mike, you got some window washing to do. Okay, okay. So last time we got together, we spoke about covenant. And um, I shared with you, I wish that someone would have shared with me that when I asked Yeshua would have come into my heart, I actually entered into a covenant. I had no idea what a covenant was. That's why um, this lesson is really the ending of last week's lesson because it was so much to throw on someone because when I first understood covenant, I really was hard for me to get a hold of grasp, but it took me time to figure it out. Um, but I wish someone would have told me what a covenant was. And we shared with you what a covenant was, that, that a covenant can be between a man and a man, or, you know, or a man and a woman. I focused on man and a woman, or covenants between man and God. And that's the two covenants, between man and man or man and God. And that was the covenants we looked at. And then we, we went back and looked at the very first time this covenant was began, which affects us as the bride of Christ. And we're going to kind of reflect on that, about that. So um, in my goings last time we got together, uh, I was sharing with you that, you know, I wish someone would have shared with me covenant because I probably just would not have made the mistakes that I would have made growing up um, because I just didn't understand uh, covenant. I didn't understand what it really meant. I probably, I, I, you know, I, I guess I, I struggled with is regret salvation? Because I've regretted a lot of things that I did in my life. Is remorse salvation? No, no. I don't know. Is remorse salvation? You know? Is it? Because I had great remorse of the things that I did to other people in the things I got involved in. With. But repentance is salvation. So there's a fine line between, you know, uh, understanding what regret is, what remorse is, what repentance is, and understanding the and thanking that the covenant that we are in with the Lord doesn't have to do with me keeping salvation. God took me back to the time when 
Abraham, God struck a covenant with Abraham. And he told Abraham to divide the carcasses. And Abraham uh, was there waiting on the Lord. And then the Lord put him asleep. He fell asleep. And then when he woke up, he saw the father as a lantern walking through the blood, letting Abraham know that this covenant I'm striking with you has nothing to do with you. It's all about me. It's my covenant. I'm striking you. We just have to agree with it. We have to agree to it. So this, uh, I, I, uh, I, in our, in our last talk, I was using myself as an example and all the struggles that I went through growing up and trying to keep in that understanding covenant and then now understanding covenant and wishing like, wow, you know, I didn't really do a good job keeping my covenant with the Lord, you know, and I'm so thankful that with, then when I asked the Lord, I'm so thankful that the covenant of my salvation is with the Lord. It's he's keeping my salvation, not me keeping my salvation. You know, uh, I am in covenant and there are things he asked me to do in, in my covenant, but, it, the, but my covenant is not about my salvation. So I know you wanted to talk because we've been this last week, we've been, we've been looking at a lot of people talking about covenant. So we talk now. Um, it's just interesting. Holy Spirit. We all have the same Holy Spirit. doesn't matter what denomination you are. If you really call on Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit. And um, different um, prophetic leaders, even teachers are talking about covenant. It's popping up everywhere. And it's like, wow, um, because that's what something's on the, on the Father's heart. And um, the, the Lord took me um, today. Well, I've, I'm reading a book about covenant also. It happens at Bloodline Covenant. And it's simultaneous, but it's not exactly what we're doing. But it, everything is cohesive, goes together. Um, but in John chapter six, Jesus talks to his disciples and those that are following him that he is the bread of life, eat of me, that drink of me and live and to eat of his flesh. And the disciples are saying, this is a hard saying, you know, we can't. And he, they're grumbling among themselves and he knows that they're grumbling. So he comes over to them because he's so good like that. He can hear our, our groanings and mutterings, but he, um, he tells them that he knows who believes in their heart, who he is, because there was all these people that were following him and they followed him because of the miracles and because he fed them. They were getting something from Jesus, but he said he knew who truly believed in him. And when he said that and that's talking about the covenant even when we take communion that's marking our covenant when he's talking about that eating his flesh and drinking his blood and being in covenant with him thousands of people just walked away and they stopped following jesus so there was a defining moment because he knew the hearts of people not only those that were going to walk away but it makes reference in john that he was talking also about judas because he walked with Jesus. He saw the miracles and in his, but Jesus knew his heart. And so at all of this stuff about covenant, it's about our hearts. It's about our hearts. God sees the heart and here are these people that were with Jesus, followed him, saw him do all these things. And I'm sure like we feel the presence of God in one of our fellow, you know, brothers or sisters. I'm sure you could feel the presence of God like crazy off of Jesus and people just wanted to be around him. But that wasn't enough because it was their hearts and they had to be in covenant and believe in their heart. With him. Yes. You know, I was um, also looking at you know, looking at my Bible um, about uh, Josiah in Second Kings chapter 23. And uh, it, it was interesting when Josiah, when Josiah um, became king of Jerusalem or Israel, um, it says right here in Second Kings chapter twenty-three, and he said, and the king said, there gathered unto him the, all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem, and the king went into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. 
men, children, everybody was there. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant, the Torah. Because remember, the Torah was lost. The book of the law was lost for many years because there was a lot of wicked kings before Josiah. And he found it in the, he found the book of the covenant in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes and all their heart with all their souls to perceive the words of, the, of this covenant was written in the book and all the people stood to that covenant. So uh, that it's, we're, we're going to find that our father is a covenant making God. And he has a covenant for each and every one of you. And it's important that for you to uh, understand when you ask Yeshua to come into your heart, you entered into a covenant. And this covenant is very important to the father. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't even talk about it. And it's interesting. You go on and read Second Kings uh, chapter 23. Uh, not only did Josiah establish reading the Torah and reading the covenant, he also took down all the strongholds, all the idols that even Solomon set up before him. King Solomon took all down and cleaned the whole uh, nation of Israel from all the idols that were already set up. You know, um, so it's interesting, you know, even that we need to make sure we take down idols in our own life. You know, things that we put before the Lord. And we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. And then he also reestablished the feast. Um, he them. they didn't do Passover for years. And we just had a little verse about Passover. <laughs> um, and King Josiah reestablished Passover. Um, so to, to the Father, covenant um, and Passover and, and his feast are so important to him. This covenant is important to him. So tonight we're going to go back uh, to look at the covenant, this agreement that we had. Um, and why the Feast of Shabbat it should be important to all the people. So that's kind of what we're doing. Are you going to get out? Okay. <laughs> Let me make sure. Anyway, so right now we are we are here tonight under a wedding hoopah. This is the wedding hoopah. At the Feast of Shabbat, we dress it up a little bit more. Tonight, I just made a really simple skeleton of it. When Yeshua, when Jewish people get married, they will actually either set this up in a field. They don't get married in a church. It's usually outside in a field on some grassy meadow. They dress the wedding hoopah up into whatever um, they reflects them, you know. So at the Feast of Shabbat, uh, we actually deck it all out. Uh, we put a door on it. Um, and then inside the wedding kupa, um, you get to um, renew your vows to your Messiah. And that's on Shabbat. Shabbat is 50 days after Passover. Last week, we shared with you that menorah. Remember? That menorah tells us what God's plan is for mankind. He has not been hiding from us at all. He has been showing us every single night. He peels back the, the blue sky. He shows us the stars. And if you knew how to read the stars, it tells you the whole story of what God is going to do. Each one of the zodiac signs, which Lucifer, uh, Halal bin Shahar, twisted, each one of the zodiac signs not only reflect a tribe, but a monk and a stone and a letter and a prophecy. And we're going to talk about that in the weeks to come. Each one of the twelve to prophecies and how they re how they affect us today. The twelve the prophecies of the boys. So I'm going to take you back a little bit into last week's lesson. Um, when the nation of Israel was leaving Egypt and Pharaoh said, you can go, just go, get out of my sight. The last plague was the death of the firstborn. And Pharaoh said, I've had enough, go. Now, I want to let you know, 
they left with a lot of gold, riches, and the Bible says there was not one feeble person among them. They just had the Passover meal because it was the death of the firstborn. They took a lamb. uh, They took a lamb on the first day of the month, brought it into and held it to the 14th day, the 14th day of the month, and washed it for three days. On the 15th day of the month of the first year, they sacrificed that lamb. They captured its blood. They put the blood on the door posts and on the top, on the lintel, not on the threshold. On this way, in the actual shape of a Hebrew letter Tav or cross, or the Hebrew letter He, which means life, or the Hebrew letter Het, which means door. So all the shape that God put there had a prophetic reason why they put the blood there, there, and there. And the whole secret was, as long as you stayed in the house covered by the blood, you lived. That's why at Passover, we do the prophetic blood arch. When you were past for last year, right? There we put a prophetic blood arch up, right? And it is you doing a prophetic act to walk through and put your life back under the blood for the entire year. Put your life back under the blood. It's a prophetic, it's a prophetic act. The same way when at Shavuot, 50 days later, you do a prophetic act by renewing your wedding vows or renewing your vows to the Messiah. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, when Moses departed from Egypt, he took the bones of Joseph because Joseph had a promise. It was a promise do not let my bones stay in Egypt and bring them to the promised land. So, they dug up, actually, they took them out of an ossuary. I'm going to give you a little piece of a little history real quick. Um, it's interesting. This is where this came from. When they, this is not part of my teaching, this is something I'll throw out here. When they uh, bury someone in Israel, they don't put them in the grave, in the ground. They don't, like we do. They put them in a, a sepulcher. They wrap the body up in fine linen and lay it in a sepulcher. They don't bring flowers. They bring remembering stones. And they put stones on it. Now, when you go to a, a Jewish cemetery, there's signs to look for. If you see a uh, uh, sepulcher that has like a tree branch on it that's a child who's buried that's what that's for so there's different things there but you go to you go to Israel and the whole Mount Olives is nothing but sepulchers and stones on top of the sepulchers you know so after one year what do they do they go to the sepulcher and take bones right and the, now the sepulcher could be used again right that's why Jesus was not in a borrowed tomb. He was, a, he was actually in a borrowed tomb. He was in the tomb of uh, uh, Joseph of Arimathea. But it's, it's interesting. When they take the bones out of the sepulcher, what do they do with them? They put them in an ostuary. What is an ostuary? It's a square box, kind of like a small trunk. And what they do is they put the bones in the bottom. And because the femurs are too long, that's what they do. Look on this way. Look on this way. Right there. What do you got? Jolly Roger. The skull and crossbones has been around for ancient times. And it's actually Jewish. So they'll take an ostuary. So Google that. I mean, any of this stuff, you can Google, you know, ostuary, Jewish ostuary, you know, and they'll it'll be a box. And, and they usually write on the outside, engrave on the stone box, who's in it, you know, just the bones. And then what they do is they take that and they stack it inside someone's tomb. So you'll see, a, you go to a tomb and there'll be like hundreds of them with people's boxes there. But the sepulchers are only used for the body. But anyway, so they told, don't, they said, Joseph said, take my bones out of Egypt. I don't want to be here. I'm going to go to the promised land. So that's what Moses did. So Yahweh leads the Israelites to the Red Sea. Remember now, he is taking them, he's rescuing them. He just did Passover with them. Where's the uh, 
he just did Passover with them. So he just did Passover. He just did unleavened bread and he just did first fruits. Okay. All those three things were all immediately done all on Passover and fulfilled with the Messiah, Yeshua. Then he leads them out, out of Egypt. How long did it take them to get from Egypt to Mount Sinai? 50 days, seven Sabbaths. That's how we get Pentecost. Means 50, Penta means 50, 50 days or seven Sabbaths. You know, seven times seven is 49, 50th day, they end up at Mount Sinai. So, but before they get to Mount Sinai, uh, Yahweh leads them to the Red Sea, which the father had to spiritually get them ready to meet him. So he takes them to a spiritual mikvah. A mikvah is a ritual bathing pool. Before you get married, you go wash yourself, you clean yourself, you put on new clothes, and you get yourself to to be married or to do something important. It's a ritual bathing pool. So he takes the entire nation of Israel and all who went with them through this, this spiritual bathing pool, the Red Sea. They come out on the other side. Moses is leading them to Mount Sinai, right? Moses leading them. Um, and then exactly 50 days later after leaving Egypt, the Israelites reached Mount Sinai. And this is what the Lord said. The Lord told Moses in Exodus 19, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bear a bear upon the eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be compute, a peculiar treasure unto me above all people and all earth is mine. The earth belongs to the Lord, but guess what? You belong to the Father. He said, you are a peculiar people. You are a holy nation. You are most treasured in my sight. And he's talking to the nation of Israel. He's talking to you today, saying the same thing. So Moses comes down, tells the people all the words the Lord said. Now, it's interesting. Notice what the people of the Lord said. All the people answered together, saying, all that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. But they haven't even heard what the Lord said they were going to do. They just said, yes. You know why? Because we saw you just beat up on the nation of Egypt. You know, whatever you say, Lord, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. He said, Father, they said, yes. Whatever you want, we will do. Now, unfortunately, the speed up, you know, he goes up there, he stays a little time, comes down, they already built a golden calf. After they just said, yes, it's kind of sad, but that's a whole other story. The people spent two days preparing themselves to meet the Lord. Why two days? Because something happens on the third day. You will notice in your Bible that, that something special happens on the third day. In John chapter 2, it will say on the third day of the week, there was a wedding in the Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. You know, it's interesting if you study that whole story, you know, it, who the mother of Jesus was there. Obviously, it was one of her kids getting married. Had to be one of her kids because why would she be worried about there's no wine? You know, so it was actually a disgrace if you ran out of wine. So she had to absolutely know or be part of the wedding of that time getting married. To come back in. So anyway, they prepared themselves to, to meet the Lord. He's on the third day. The Lord ascended from Mount Sinai with a fire, a smoke furnace, and a mountain quake, and a, and a cloud came down, just like a hoopah, came down on top of Mount Sinai. A wedding hoopah came down. And on that same third day, Moses ascends to Mount Sinai and receives a covenant, a ketubah, at the same place where he uh, he, he, uh, where the Lord appeared to Moses on the burning bush the same six years earlier. So he gave us a ketubah. So we are going to hand out today's lesson. How long before did you say? What's that? You said you met at the same place. 
how many years before? Six years earlier. Yes. Okay. Same place he met. I've heard it said three. Six years. Well, yes. yeah. Sounds good. Six years earlier. I think when we the story, sometimes I think it's, it happens all at once. Right? It happens all at once. Or, or even that the, 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 well, the plagues took a year. You know. And you know what's interesting? Well, if you if you if you read the story with the plagues and and when and when uh, Pharaoh's dealing with the frogs and he's got frogs everywhere and Moses says I can get rid of the frogs and he goes ah, how about tomorrow do you want to spend one more night with the frogs <laughs> but but Pharaoh goes yeah maybe tomorrow but it's tomorrow isn't it bad enough but anyway so here's the interesting here is the wedding ketubah. God gave man. And I'm going to read it to you and hope you to understand God's heart. It was asked when we talked about who, who Lucifer's real name was, that his real name was Halal ben Shahar. And we found out how his name got turned to Lucifer. And it was a question was asked, why would God create Lucifer if he knew he was going to fall? Well, the question would be, why would God continue to create man if he knew Lucifer was going to rebel? And we talked about it was out of love. And remember, when Lucifer bricked Eve, he said, Eve, isn't his rules burdensome remember is he holding something out on you he was trying to tell eve that all these rules that god has that you can't touch you can't eat of that tree that's i mean he's mean he's he's, he's tough see there's this idea in the church that the old testament is a god of judgment and a god who hates you and a god you must obey it's never been that way He's always been a God of love. In fact, the covenant that we, at least I don't know about y'all, but I agreed to, I grew up thinking this covenant was out of obedience because that's how I visioned, visioned Papa. But it's really out of love. And when I rolled back and read it, the, our covenant, our agreement, our ketubah, with the love of the father or with the understanding of a love between myself and my wife or others who are here who are married, then I realized it was the love of the father, how he wrote this ketubah to us. And this is how it came together. Because the same covenant that I said yes to is this same covenant, but only through a renewed covenant with the Messiah. It's the same covenant. It's just the renewed through the blood of the Messiah and not through bulls and goats. The concept of a covenant between God, the groom, and Israel, the bride. This ketubah describes how each of the partners in the covenant should relate to each other. The requirements of this ketubah are divided into two parts and are recorded in Exodus 20. How to live in harmony with our bridegroom. Our bridegroom is Yeshua. At this time, at the very first time, the bridegroom was Yahweh and the bride was Israel and all who came with her, which would have been me. Because I believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses, and Aaron. So it would have been me in this ketubah. Here's what the father said. I want you to recognize the sovereignty of the bridegroom. I want you to understand who I am. I am your bridegroom. You are my bride. I want you to understand who I am and who you 
said yes to. He said, do not put anything or anyone before your covenant. That's why I'm in covenant with her. You're not going to come in my home and see a half-naked poster picture of some girl that I think she's hot. Because that's putting something before my covenant. I don't have posters of things in my house that I shouldn't be looking at because that would be putting a covenant an idol or a co something before my covenant. And it's amazing when you just look around. That's all I'm saying. Just look around. What's out there? He said, don't put anything or anyone before our covenant. Then he said, do not misuse the bridegroom's sacred name. This is way more than cussing. When you're out with my name because we're in covenant together, act like we're in covenant together. Don't go, don't be this way at church and that way in the world. I shouldn't see you in places you don't belong. Don't go out and smear our, my sacred name because you're in covenant with me. So now, see, we're, we're having to keep some things here. He said, remember to spend time with the bridegroom. Do you know what that one's called? Remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. Remember to spend time with the bridegroom. All he's saying is, you know what? You can spend the whole six days of the week trying to save the world. But one day of the week, you got to spend some time with me. I'm jealous. I'm jealous for your affection. I'm jealous for you. And I want to spend time with you. Will you spend time with me? And it's interesting that menorah, that seven branch menorah, on the seventh day, God rested. And that's why Israel went into captivity, because after seven years, the land has to rest. It's called a Shemitah. If the land doesn't rest, God will hold you accountable. And that is not only for Jewish people, that's for the entire world because the world belongs to the Lord and he put things in Shemitah cycles that the land is supposed to be fallow for seven years or on the seventh year. It, isn't it interesting? When Joseph was in Egypt, Pharaoh had a dream. What was the dream? Seven, seven fat cows, seven good ears of corn, followed by seven what? Right, was a Shemitah. Why? Because they were not following God's laws that he set up way back in the garden. But anyway, he said, remember to spend time with me one day of the week. I just want your time one day a week. That's still true today. And then he said, I want you to honor those who stand in the place when I'm away from you. When I'm not with you, honor those who stand in my place. And we know what that is. Are any of those real difficult? And he's saying them out of love. But you know what Halal bin Shahar says? Oh, he's a, look at that. He wants you to obey. And he wants you to do this. And he wants you to do that. And we as Christians or followers or even pastors have sat and preached in the pulpit the commandments of God. And they're not commandments. It's a wedding ketubah. Now let me ask you, if I was asking my wife this, is, would this be something you'd be asking from me? Would you ask me to uh, recognize that you're my wife? Would you want me to say, have no other person in front of you? My eyes to be only on you? Would you want to know that I, I just don't go around and slander who my wife is and tell Bad things about you? Is it too much for me to ask that, you know, to spend some time with you? Or to honor your mom and dad when you're not around? Come on! This is a wedding ketubah. This is not what we thought it was. But then he goes on to say, now, when you're out there, I want this is how I want you to live your life as my bridegroom. I want you to protect Crimes against humanity. 
You want to know why Joseph's, why, excuse me, why David baby had to die? He did a crime against humanity. He took another man's wife and another man's future, his family, his life, his livelihood, everything that that man could possibly have, he stole it from him. And that is a crime against humanity. Do you know why the blood cried out from the ground when Cain slew Abel? Because Cain did a crime against humanity. He took Abel's life, his future, everything that Abel could have been. And today, as a nation, as a world, we set, we set, a lot, we set aside and let crimes against humanity when women decide to say, my, my, my body, my choice. It is a crime against humanity. And God said, don't kill. Don't kill. We're not going to go talk about war and all that big debate and everything, but God said, well, when the crime against humanity, don't do it. And as your bride, as your representative of me, you're my bride, please protect the crimes against humanity. And then he said, protect the sanctity, the sanctity of marriage. Don't sleep around. You know, and then, you know, yeah, and then Yeshua went on even to go deeper than that. Protect the sanctuary marriage. Don't commit adultery. Uphold honesty with integrity. Just be honest. I tell you what, if you want to fight the devil, use truth. Because there's no truth found in him. You could beat the devil by just telling the truth. Because there's none in him. He, don't think that you're going to try to have a covenant relationship with the devil because all his heart's desire is to kill, steal, and destroy you because he wished you were never around to begin with. He didn't like you from the beginning and he doesn't like you now and he's not going to play fair if you think you're going to have some deal with the devil or his corporate. Anyway, uphold the integrity of speaking the truth. Oh, actually, that was don't steal. Honesty of integrity. Uphold integrity of speaking truth. Don't lie. And honor others whom the Father has prospered. If, if the Lord has prospered you more than me, hallelujah. I have to keep my, I have to look at my own backyard. I have no right looking at your backyard. If the Lord's prospered you, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And that's where it should stay. If I want to really understand my wedding covenant agreement with the Lord. This is what happened on the first Mount Sinai Shavuot. It wasn't called Pentecost then. It was called the Feast of Shavuot. The Feast of Harvest. Anyway, remember... If either party disregards this covenant, this agreement, it is to violate the marriage covenant itself, is, is to violate the marriage covenant itself. Jeremiah 29 tells us that, the, that the, the groom only wishes to bless you. This is your covenant. This is the covenant that you said was with, well, we're going we're gonna to be sure. The bridegroom wishes to bless you and keep you. The bridegroom wishes to shine his face upon you. The bridegroom wishes to be gracious to you. The bridegroom wishes to lift up his favor to you. And the bridegroom gives you his most precious peace. Now, here's what's crazy. This ketubah, this covenant was so sacred. What did God do with it? Turn to the next page. He said, Moses. Build me a safety deposit box. I need one. Cuban and a half side, Cuban and a half high, two and a half cubits long. In fact, when you come to Shabbat, you will stand before it. Huh? Huh? Literally, at Shabbat, 
we have a wedding in Cuba like this. Uh, we actually a wedding Koopa. We dress it up a little bit more. There's a door on it. One door is, is blue. One door is red. One door is purple because that's what the Holy of Holies was. Understand, it's just like the Allah. It's red, it's blue, and man is red. How do you get purple? By mixing blue and red. The, the veil on the Holy of Holies was blue. It was red, blue, purple, red. Because that's where God and man came together. In her, in the, and what was inside the Holy of Holies? A safety deposit box. The Ark of the Covenant. Actually, actually, God called it the Ark of His Testament. I was going to bring it here tonight, but I can't do that because I want to give you something to look forward at Shavuot. Because at Shavuot, you come in. Well, let me back up. There's a there, there'll be there'll be a, the Ark of the Covenant here. There's a picture of Yeshua. You come in if you want to. You don't have to. You. Prepare your hands and wash your hands and prepare your heart. You come over here, all inside the, in the wedding hoopa. You take communion. You reach out and grab your ketubah, which you're going to get a copy of it tonight. And you stand before the Ark of the Covenant and look him dead in the eyes and say it like you mean. That's Shavuot. So what did God do with this ketubah, this wedding covenant that was most precious to him? He says, Moses, I need a box. I need a safety deposit box. 18 inches wide, 18 inches tall, 45 inches long. I need you to make it just like this. I need a lid on top of it. And, and I need two angels on top of it. In fact, well, in fact, I'll tell you a story one time about the art, the art that we, I built. And so... He said, take this, this wedding ketubah and stick it inside the ark. You have one, I have one. There's two copies. You have one, I have one. Put it inside there. What is he saying? This is the ark of his testimony. This is the ark of his testimony to you. What is he saying? By putting the tablets in there, he's saying, I will keep my promise to you. Then he said, Moses, put a jar of manna in there. What is he saying to you? I will always feed you. You don't have to worry about where your next meal is coming from. In spite of every, the high inflation and everything, you're not going to have to worry about where your meal comes from because you're in a covenant with him. I mean, do you remember when David ran up to Goliath and said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who's not in couple with our father? You know, and then slew him. Amazing. And then he said, take Aaron's rod that budded. You know that story. Take it and put it in the ark. Why? Why? Because I want you to know I will always lead you. I will always shepherd you. I will always take care of you. And then get what he does. He says, put a lid on. And what is the lid called? The mercy seat. And guess what? Mercy always covers the law. Mercy always covers the covenant. Doesn't matter how much you screw up or how much the nation of Israel screws up, mercy always covered it. And then he put his Shekinah glory on it because remember what was Uriah did when he touched it? Uzziah? What happened? He died. You can't touch it. He put his Shekinah glory on it. That Ketubah, which inside the Ark of the Covenant, along with the other things, is so important. The relationship he has with you is so important, you can't even touch it or you'll die. You can't feel it. You can't take it away. That's why I believe that neither not neither height nor depth nor things of this earth, the things of that earth, the things to come, or any angel, anybody can pluck you out of the Father, can pluck you out of the covenant if you are in covenant with the Father. And he put that in. So at Shavuot, after we tell the whole story of Shavuot and the story of Boaz and Ruth, because the whole story of Ruth happened in the 50 days, by the way, you know that? In the 50 days between Passover, the whole story happens then. You know, so on Shavuot, they do the story of 
Boaz and Ruth and so forth. We tell you a lot about what's going on here. And then what happens is we have the whole hoopla up there and you can come in and renew your wedding covenant. That's your prophetic act. You actually will get, oh, no, it's going to be your, your, uh, your face scroll this week. Your face scroll is going to be your wedding tuba. So you can take it, and every time you take communion, you can read that wedding ketubah. In fact, I'll have Trisha read it here, or someone read it here. We'll pass it out to you. The wedding ketubah, but we'll do it in a minute here. So, but um, I wanted to share this one thing. I like to throw out some Hebrew to you. The next page tells you what the word covenant means in Hebrew. On your next page. Your next page, the Hebrew word for covenant is berit. Berit. Yes. Spelled bet resh. So starting from the right, starting from the right to the left, bet is a ba or B, or Resh is an R, or an R, right? And then we have a Yud, which is an I, also could be other letters depending on how they go together. And then we have a Tav, which is a T, Barit. That's the word for covenant. But it also has actually letters. Check this out. The Hebrew letter Bet, the first letter B, means in, in practical, practical, practical form of the word, it means house. Okay? In the prophetic portion of that word, it means son. Now, resh, in the practical part, means head. In the prophetic part, it means highest person. Now, notice... Remember the name Halel bin Shahar? Bin Bet Nun is son of. But, but Bet Resh Bar is also son of. Like, for instance, do you remember the guy who stood with Jesus? What was his name at his trial? Barabbas. That was his Greek name. His Hebrew name was Bar Abba. In fact, I'm going to show you something that I was sharing with someone earlier. I'm going to take a little side step here. Hold on. In IV. Oh. In IV. Matthew chapter 20. Try. Yeah. I am going to have someone come up here and read this for me. So it's not me reading this. Uh, who wants to come up and read? All right, Mayos, come on up here. Now, this is, inter this is interesting. This is interesting. On your, on your timeline here. There is a feast in the fall called Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Okay? On Yom Kippur, they will bring in two male goats. Okay? Two male goats. And these goats are identical in age, size, color, everything. Right? One goat is the goat to the Lord called the La, La Adonai. And the La Azel is the goat, which is called the escape goat. Now, let me show you something. In our covenant, you got to think, think this back. With Adam, with Adam, gave away his authority. The blessing went to Halal bin Hashahar, 
and the curse went to man. This happened, right? When Cain slew Abel, Cain was the oldest, Abel was the youngest, this happened. Seth, when Esau and Jacob, Esau sold his birthright to the youngest, and this happened. Ishmael and Isaac, Isaac and Ishmael, they crossed over. Ephraim and Manasseh crossed over. This happens even at Yeshua's tribe. We have on the, on the feast of Yom Kippur, atonement, they bring in two goats that are identical. Identical in age and how they look. One goat is scapegoat and one goat is to be sacrificed. This happens. Okay? Now check this out. In, in the NIV, Matthew chapter 27, Uh, start right uh, right here. Start down in here where uh, down, uh, uh, yeah, right here, right here. So Matthew 27 verse 15 says, now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a Passover. Passover's happening because Jesus was crucified on Passover to fulfill the Passover feasts and the, the uh, unleavened bread and the first fruits, right? So this is Passover, and you can't be hanging on the cross at Passover. That's why they had to take him down. That's why they were going to break his legs they were dead. You so, so nothing by chance, right? Nothing by chance. It was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus or Abbas. Barabbas' name was Jesus. Yeshua or Abba. Bar, son of Abba, and his name is Yeshua or Abba. And standing next to you, want this, you want this one. <laughs> all right, all right. Jesus Barabbas, 17 says, So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? So here we have at his Passover, I mean, at his, 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 his trial, we have Yeshua Barabba. And Yeshua Baraba, the son of the father, and the son of the father. And this happened. The curse went to you. The, 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 the blessing of the oldest went to Baraba, and the curse went to Yeshua. Maybe. Nothing's by chance. And that was corrected between the two people. Amazing. Nothing's by chance. Nothing's by chance. So, in the name Barit, covenant, it means in the Hebrew letters, it talks about the highest person of the house, his hands are on a cross. Is that not amazing? Even in the word covenant, it's talking about a Messiah whose hands are going to be on a cross. I find that absolutely amazing. So anyway, our ketubah that we're going to hand out tonight. Oh, you already did. Over here. So at Shavuot, which now, next time we meet, we are taking you into Shavuot. We're taking you in the upper room. We're taking you up at what, they, what we call Pentecost. I don't like to call it Pentecost. It's a Greek name. Greek name means 50, 50 days. It's actually called Shavuot. But we're going to take you to the upper room and actually show you what happened that day. It is way more. Now, I understand. 
the Feast of Shavuot is about your wedding ketuba. It's not about speaking in tongues. I mean, it's way more about speaking in tongues. But yet, when we talk about, let's go, man, let's go, you don't want to speak in tongues. It has nothing, it really doesn't mean much about speaking in tongues. There's so much more gifts that we're giving. That day, you became the bride of Christ. Before that time, the, they, they, all they did was enter into it, but the, the patrol would come and begin until Shavuot. For us, it was foreshadowed back in the Old Testament in the first covenant on Mount Sinai and now fulfilled for us when Yeshua gave his spirit and his spirit, our, our soul is large enough to hold all of him. That's why our soul was large enough to hold a thousand legion of demons. Our soul is large enough. You got all of the Holy Spirit. Every bit of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to show you the next time we get together when we take you to the to, to Pentecost or Shavuot in the upper room what happened and what you got. That's where we're heading with all this. Now you're finding your authority. Your authority is you are in covenant with the Father. You're in a wedding relationship with the Father. Your ten, your ten Commandments way more than what you ever would think. We are in a covenant. And, and the Lord gave you so many things. Yeah, we'll just take you there. We'll leave you there for, for the next time we get together. So here is the ketubah. This is the ketubah that you will get. You'll get another one. But this is your, this is your, uh, uh, your face scroll. This is what you will take on Shavuot. So I would encourage you to come to Shavuot. If Passover's fun, Passover's important, but understand, God wasn't interested in just saving you. He wanted you back in that relationship. He redeemed you, and the four cups of Passover talks about what he's going to do. He redeemed you. He's now in relationship with you. Then what do you do? I want you with, I want you, I want you with me. And, and it's all about Shavuot. It's all about Sukkot. Eventually, one day, we will be in the presence of the Father again. He wants you with him. him. So, this is the good thing. So, this is good to do with you when you take communion. Take, yeah, take communion. And right now, I'm taking communion daily. So. <laughs> Father, we just, we love you. Thank you. I, I did insert your name, but I'll be fine. Trisha, take you. Yeshua HaMashiach, to be my beloved betrothed bridegroom. I do promise and covenant before you, Abba, to be Yeshua's loving and faithful bride. Forsaking all other gods and idols in my life, my affections and attentions will be on you. With my whole heart, I will love you, obey and serve you. I am I am in you, and you are in me. We are one. In plenty and in want, I will serve you. In joy and in sorrow, I will obey you. In sickness and in health, I will love you. I will faithfully occupy, carry on, and be busy with our Father's business until he sends you to carry me to our forever home. For my beloved is mine, and I am his. I seal this covenant with the first cup of Ketubah agreement. The second cup of Ketubah, I eagerly await to drink with you, my beloved, at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I am 100% completely yours body, soul, spirit, mind, and heart. Amen. You know, um, that last part, at the Passover, there's one last cup. And that cup is usually called the Elijah cup. 
because the Passover we present is a messianic Passover. Understanding that Yeshua is the Messiah and he has come and, you know, we don't look for Elijah. We don't put a cup out for Elijah. In the past, we have held this cup up in faith that one day, because remember what Yeshua said, I will not eat over this, I will not eat of this Passover or drink of this cup until I drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom. Remember? Now understand, he said that to his disciples in the upper room after Judas left. And all of them were Galileans. Judas was the Galilean. All of them were Galileans. He was talking about a Galilean wedding, the same wedding you read about in John chapter 2 when the mother of Jesus was a Galilean wedding. When you understand the Galilean wedding, and, and I, I shared this with other people, I would love to teach it, but I have to have actors. I can't do it by myself. I've got to have all of you involved to understand the Galilean wedding. The, the, the father... And I'm actually speaking out of turn. This is the next week's stuff. But anyway, the father brings the bridegroom to the bride and gives the bridegroom then takes a cup and gives it to her. He will drink out of it and then he will give it to her. And then she has two, two choices. She can drink of it and say, yes, that I am now betrothed to you. We're not married yet. Well, technically we are married, but we haven't consummated our marriage, you know, but we haven't, we're betrothed to one another. You belong to me and I belong to you. The wedding isn't going to happen until we get to heaven. That wedding is, our, our, our wedding is still, Jesus' wedding isn't still, our wedding isn't still, we get to heaven. And it's interesting when you study this, the, John chapter 2, the Galilean wedding. Guess how long the wedding lasts? Seven days. Thank God we don't have weddings like that. Seven days. That's why it would be very bad if you ran out of wine. Because it take, it, they last for seven days. You know? So all during the whole tribulation period is going to be the marriage, is going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb and the and the the famous seat where we receive our rewards from our Messiah for the things that we did for him on the earth. Those are the crowns we're getting. And there's like, you understand, there's like five crowns you can get, you know, and those are the crowns that he's going to wear. He's going to wear your, because we're going to take our crowns and lay them back at his feet, you know, and he's going to wear our crowns. But, uh, but in Passover, we would always say, hey, this is the cup that we look forward. We actually, we actually kind of, Prophetically fulfill that cup and say yes at Shabbat, at the Feast of Shabbat. Shabbat is way more than just what we think it is. You think Passover is a blast. Shabbat is really cements your relationship with the Lord. And then when you go to Sukkot in the fall, and Sukkot is by invitation only. Well, because you can't go, you might be one of the 10 virgins that don't go. So it's by invitation only, and you come into the whole thing to sit down and wine and dine and all that kind of thing. Anyway, we're done. You can wrap it up. Did anybody have any questions that they wanted to ask on Zoom? I hope you're enjoying this so far. That was good. Yeah. Do y'all have any questions, Zoom? Zoom people, about tonight's lesson. Are y'all good? Okay. Bible? Yes. Uh, there's well, there's the uh, well, that's what's my Bible, but heaven, there's, a, there's a crown of rejoicing. There's a martyr's crown. There's a uh, for soul winner's crown. Um, and incorruptible crown. Uh, yeah, actually, there's there's crown of life. Yeah, crown of There you go. Life, righteousness. Glory, 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 and the crown of exaltation. Five, five crowns. We did a table of that before yeah. with the five crowns. Oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so I think that um is going to conclude today. Yes. yes. So, so um, next week we're going to talk about. Uh, oh, next time we get together, we're going to talk about. Actually, we're going to go to the upper room, and we're going to go for the feast of Shabbat, which is Pentecost. And we're going to reveal Pentecost 
And kind of the same way we did the story of the Good Samaritan, we're going to do it the same way. And, and just lay out everything that happened uh, at what you receive, what you receive, what we receive on the Feast of Shavuot was way more than what we ever dreamed. And, and, that, and that really began, the hope begins, actually helped us begin to understand walking in our authority when we understood what was given to us, you know. So um, usually when we end and click off on the camera, we pray here. Um, I know um, those who join us on Zoom that uh, Jennifer and her family are sick. And um, our brother, Randy, who had surgery, um, he's having some heart issues and he's having to be in bed. So you can extend your hands to the camera where you're, you're at. We're going to pray and I'll see the blessing. So, Father, I just lift up before you, Jennifer and her family. And I lift up before you, Randy. Papa, you are our Rafa. You are their Rafa. And Father, we just come against these attacks on our bodies and the body of Christ and the bride of Christ. We say no more in Jesus' name. For Yeshua, we are seated in heavenly places with you. And you say in First John that as you are in heaven, so are we on the earth. You don't have any kind of stomach flu. You don't have heart problems. You are perfect and wonderful. And so we're declaring that we as the body are perfect and wonderful, but Jennifer and her family and Randy is perfect and wonderful with nothing missing, nothing broken in their bodies. Thank you, Jesus. And release the ironic blessing over us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you. May he turn his countenance to you and give you his shalom. Yeva harechecha Adonai Shalom that our Yeshua purchased for us of nothing missing, nothing broken, wholeness, healing, completeness in your mind, in your body, in your heart, in your emotion, in your family, in your finances, be yours in the mighty name of Yeshua. Amen. We love you. Thank you Shalom. so much for watching, for joining us. Shalom. Yeah. Thank you.